In my video on Young's double slit experiment, I demonstrated how using two slits, firing a red laser through them, and then examining the fringe patterns that it created, we determined the wavelength of that light. However, there's one limitation of this technique, and that was the closeness of the intensity lines, and they were much wider and therefore difficult to measure precisely, and so therefore leading to inaccurate results. Now these days, we often examine interference of light using what is referred to as a diffraction grating. So what is a diffraction grating? Well, in a way, it's like our slits, but instead of having two or three, we actually have many. So for example, this one, labeled as 300 lines per millimeter, basically means I've got 300 slits for every millimeter. And if I put that in front of my camera and look at some light sources, you'll see these lovely rainbows. But why is that? Well, I will explain that a little bit later, but before we do, let's see what happens when I use this with our red laser. So now I have here my laser again, and you'll note that the distance between my laser and my screen is significantly closer. In this case, it's maybe a half a meter or so, Whereas in my interference video on Young's uh, slit experiment, we had a distance of uh, roughly five meters. And that's because the angle uh, the, of deviation we're getting between the two intense maxima was quite small. And so we needed that distance in order to be able to get some sort of precision in measuring the separation between them. But in this case, we don't need that because we're using a diffraction grating. And in this case, my diffraction grating is 300 lines per millimeter. So we've got these slits. 300 of them every millimeter. Now this is not even the largest. I can get one that's a thousand or even 1600, but 300 will suffice for our experiment here. Now you'll notice my bright spot just here. It's a little more focused simply because there is a little bit of dispersion going on from long distances. So we've got a nice clean spot this time. And so now what we're going to do is we're going to place my diffraction grating in front of my laser light. So I'm gonna move this forward like so. And all of a sudden, you can see we clearly have some bright spots. This is still our central spot right there, but we now have a maximum here and a maximum that goes off our page, clearly getting uh, it's constructive interference here and also here and no uh, constructive interference, in fact, destructive interference in between. And the thing that you should note is that, first of all, we have a really large separation between the central line and the very next line, uh, unlike our normal uh, double slit experiment where we had, they were quite close. There's a large significant deviation that we're getting here, even though we're probably less than a meter away from the laser. Now, there also, you'll note that the bright spots are much, much more defined, and so that makes it really much easier to measure the distance between them and combine those two things we should be able to determine the wavelength of our red laser with a much uh, greater precision and uh, therefore a greater accuracy uh, with, the with the measurements that we're taking. So in this case I'm measuring this to be about 128 uh, millimeters. So um, we're going to use that in a moment to determine the wavelength of our laser. So before we start, let's have a look at what happens to the interference patterns as we increase the number of slits. So we're gonna start with a single slit and then we're going to move to two, three, four, five, and finally seven. I wanna reveal these to you and I want you to see if you can identify two distinguishing features that are changing as we increase the number of slits. So there's one, there's two, there's three, there's four, five, and seven. What do you notice? The first thing you should notice is that there is an overall trend of what we call our single slit envelope, that we have a clear bright section in the middle and then two areas on either side. You see that pattern on both sides. But what you should also note is that we are getting different constructive and destructive interference patterns, and two things are happening. Firstly, the size of our interference spots, this spot here represents our central maximum, is becoming smaller and smaller. Now we are getting some of a mixture of constructive and destructive interference in between, but 
as I increase the number of slits, you'll see that they progressively disappear until we get to seven slits, they're all gone. So if you were given the task of measuring the distance between the central maximum and the first one, you can see this is going to be fraught with some inaccuracy. When we get to seven, you can see that this is going to be easier to identify. Now to make my point, let's have a look at the intensity graphs of these situations. So here is my single slit. So quite a broad intensity graph. My single slit, we have our overall envelope, but now the maxima are separated here by small distances, but you'll see that the actual peak is much narrower. As I move down to three, you can see that my intensities are narrower still and separated by a larger distance. And finally for five, they're really, really tight, which means if I were to measure between two maxima for the five, I'd have much greater precision than let's say for the double. So what if I keep pushing that to more and more slits? And what you see here is what we refer to as a diffraction grating. And that diffraction grating has basically lots of slits. And we're talking about, let's say, if it's something was in the order of, uh, let's say, a thousand lines per millimeter, then the separation would not be uh, 50 microns. It would be only one micron because a thousand lines per millimeter is a million lines per meter. And if you invert that, you're going to get one that is only a micron in size. And we have lots of them. Now, what I've done here is we have a, and I borrowed this image from Hyperphysics Online, so I'm a credit to them, is I have a mixture of red and blue light. And this is supposed to show, like our double slit interference, that our light diffracts differently for different wavelengths. So we'll discuss that a little bit later, but you can see here my central maximum is the mixture of the red and blue. And then we've got clearly our first maximum here for red and here our first maximum for blue and successively onwards. But why is this? So here's my diffraction grating. So here I have the paths, possible paths coming from a particular slit. And on here, I've got two others on either side. And you'll see that just using those three representatives, there are certainly areas where they all would constructively interfere and others where they won't constructively interfere. So we're gonna get paths that really, basically the central point is, is that every single slit here has a light ray where they always constructively interfere here in the center. But let's look further into the mathematics. So here is my diffraction grating and my diffraction grating, we're gonna give a value of N and N is usually uh, mentioned either in number of lines per centimeter or lines per millimeter. And you need to convert that to the distance for each individual diffraction point by doing the inverse of that. So, so let's say I have a diffraction grating of let's say 300 lines per millimeter. Well, that means I have actually three by 10 to the power of six lines per meter. Now, if I invert that, I get the actual distance for one point. So that means I go one over that N and I'm going to get one over three by 10 to the power of six. And that will give me 3.33 by 10 to the power of negative six meters. So my, for, for my 300 lines per millimeter, diffraction grading, I have a D value of 3.33 micrometers. Let's have a look at our maximum. So over here, and if I were to mathematically work out the angle here, so you know that in the past, what we've done is we've drawn a line here, lovely straight line, of course, and we can work out the angle that is in this particular position. Here's my angle over here. Well, then our first maximum, our lambda, is the same formula that we've dealt with with our Young's double slit experiment, which is d sine theta. But what we did with the double slit was that we made sine theta equal this distance, which was going to be our y, and this distance, which is going to be l, and we're gonna make sine theta just y over l. And that was because the tan theta of that angle approximates to sine theta. Well, we can't do that in this case, because you'll find 
as, as, I've, as you've seen in the video, the angles are too large for, for that. So what we need to first do is work at angle through tan theta. So we know that tan theta is equal to this distance, that is y over l. Now, in the video, I discussed the measurements that I made, and my measurements in this case was a distance of 12.8 centimeters divided by, and in that case, I had 66 centimeters. And that led an angle of equaling 10.97 degrees. Now I can substitute that into this formula. So my lambda, and notice that I've made m equal one because we're only interested in the first order maximum here, is equal to d, which we established was already 3.33 by 10 to the power of negative six, and then multiplied that by sine theta. In this case, we've got sine of my angle of 10.97 degrees. That should give my value for the wavelength of the light that I'm using. And when I get to calculate that out, I'm going to get a value of 633.7 nanometers. And do you remember, if you watch my video, I actually know the wavelength of my red laser here. It's 632.8 nanometers. So when I compare those two values, I'm going to get an error of 0.14%. Now that is pretty good when you consider that my example in my young double slip experiment, I had an, an error of about one and a half to two percent. So that is your diffraction grading. You can see I'm going to get much greater precision. Now what would happen if I were to replace this light with blue light or any other color for that matter? As I discussed earlier, is that the blue light will have a smaller angle because blue light has a smaller wavelength. And so our angle will end up being smaller because we're not changing the value for D. But in between blue and red, we have other colors. So what will we get? Well, if we have all the colors of the rainbow, of course, this is actually simply white light. And then if it passes through our diffraction grating, you see that we get the rainbow sort of effect on either side because red is diffracting over here, blue is diffracting over here, and that's the same on the other side. Now why that is so useful is that if this light is white light, but certain wavelengths are removed, then you're going to see gaps in your rainbow over here. If, for example, this light was only a mixture of certain colors, such as what a sodium lamp would do, then you're going to get only very discrete lines here for the colors that are actually there, because every single color has a different position on the spectrum here in terms of its diffraction, which means it's very useful to determine various features of the light that you are measuring. And we use that in astronomy. And I have the video where I discuss that as well on spectra, and I encourage you to look at that. But basically, spectroscopes use diffraction gratings to separate the colors. Now, the concept of diffraction and interference using multiple slits or sources leads to a number of uses. So for example, spectroscopy, where you can analyze the light from, let's say, astronomical objects like stars, nebulas, galaxies. And I already have a couple of videos that examine this more closely, and I encourage you to look at the links in the description below. We can also see diffraction effects from surfaces such as CDs and DVDs. But actually, if I use different types of electromagnetic radiation with a much smaller wavelength, so for example, X-rays, I can actually use these properties to study the atomic structure of substances using diffraction. And this is commonly referred to as X-ray crystallography. And I'm going to examine this closely in a future video. So hopefully you've got a better understanding of diffraction, and interference and the use of diffraction gratings to examine that. So make sure you leave a comment below if it did help you. And also make sure you like and subscribe so that you can learn more about physics presented at a high school level. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. See you next time.